Hey everyone, it's old Curtis, a.k.a. CT, a.k.a. Curtis Black, executive director of TTRP Theater Media and the positive thinking producer of How to Play Cult Divinity Lost video series. I wanted to stick in a quick thank you and encourage you to take advantage of the free subscription if you find value in what you're watching or think others might. Just click this red subscribe button and you're done. If you don't want to miss our next drop, click the little bell icon and you'll get a notification when it does. All of that works the old YouTube algorithm and helps in showing this video to more Cult Divinity Lost fans like me and you. Giving us a thumbs up or down also helps, but more than that, it helps us know what works and what needs fixed or cut and drop a comment to tell us what we've got right or wrong. All of that helps us improve and bring you the content you enjoy from our little theater. Thanks. Jerry, as you head back to the barn where you found the shovel, the thoughts of the recent horrors you've had to deal with begin to wear on your mind. The image of your lost friend sneaks into the cracks between your thoughts. The sound of the barn door slamming shut breaks the painful reminiscing and the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. Your hand grips the shovel tightly and you hear the dragging steps of something else in the barn with you now. What do you do? Welcome to How to Play Cult Divinity Lost, the video series meant to give a little glimpse beyond the veil of the core rules. Cult Divinity Lost is a horror tabletop role-playing game for adults, where you escape your nightmares, bargain with demons, and try to stay alive in a world stacked deep with torture, pain, and death. That's the bad news. The good news, death is only the beginning. This video will take a short look at conflicts found in the core rules, Chapter 5, The Game Master. Conflict, dare I say it, it is the reason many people play tabletop role-playing games like Cult Divinity Lost. Certainly that's true amongst the more common fantasy-style role-playing games where combat can consume a large percentage of your game session. That is not the case, typically, with the 4th edition of Cult. While there is most definitely an abundance of conflict, combat is usually not the desired course of action. A conflict takes place when two or more parties with differing and irreconcilable goals encounter each other in the pursuit of those goals. Henry D. Green, Esquire, at your service. Given the example above, Jerry is likely wanting to leave the barn, but whatever has shuffled in behind him probably has differing goals. This is conflict. Time for a move, Jerry. As the Game Master, your job will be to moderate the conflict, locating triggers, distinguishing moves, and using hold. Before you go crashing in and setting up hours of conflicts for your players, you will need to understand a few things. That starts with the first rule of conflict. There are no rules. Cult Divinity Lost doesn't have any rules designed for handling conflict. Any kind of conflict for that matter. In reality, there are four types of conflict. Man against man, man against self, man against nature, and man against society. Each are potential conflicts possible in the realms of cult divinity lost like Metropolis, Inferno, Dreams, Madness, Passion, Elysium. You can see the possibilities. It makes no difference what the circumstances are or the type of conflict they are faced with. The players can only rely on their moves and edges as they would in any other situation in the game. That is all part of the conversation described in a previous tutorial in this series. Players do things. They run into obstacles. The conversation continues. The fiction is determined. The way a conflict escalates depends on the choices the player and you, the Game Master, will make. The Game Master sets the tone with choices made for the NPCs or other obstacles, and the PC chooses for their character. 
Normal people don't typically escalate conflicts beyond the level of discussion, and when it rises to violence, more yet will attempt to get away and avoid the harm and pain they could suffer from such an occurrence. Only psychopaths, or at least individuals who've been desynthesized completely to violence, go to it first when it comes to conflicts. Few of them can stomach the horror that we leave after such indulgences take place. As the Game Master, you must set the tone and reinforce it with consequences that are true to the fiction. Like most things in Cult Divinity Lost, the order of the actions of conflict is determined by the fiction. If violence sets off, you might need to determine an order for PC and NPC actions. Who started the conflict should act first, PC or NPC. Typically, a move is made and that move will establish a natural flow, offering opportunities and well-timed moments for others to make moves and keep it all naturally within the fiction. Other times might require you to use one of the methods described in the core rules on page 156. Use the fixed order or an order based on the fiction. You should use the fixed order unless it of course affects the fiction. An easy method is to get all of the player's reactions at once and then fit them into the fiction appropriately. As the game master, you can also create drama, tension, or suspense by altering the order or moving between the different aspects of the conflict. Your selection of moves and the use of hold, the difficulty you establish, even the description of the conflict you give, can have a significant impact on the course of the conflict escalation. You can establish the probability of a tense negotiation or a violent encounter depending on the fiction of your game. Try to stay consistent with your goals, but be flexible and aware so that you can continue to steer the narrative without losing control of the conflicts. When a player character is harmed in Cult Divinity Lost, refer to the charts on page 158 as a guide for the damage to be inflicted as to how it was caused. There is a reference for both circumstantial harm, as well as harm inflicted by specific weapons. The players start with a very limited amount of harm they can withstand, much like actual humans. So it is important to stay fair and consistent with the harm you inflict. The harm you inflict should also feed the fiction and build the story, even in the event of character death. It is only the beginning, after all. When multiple people are involved in a conflict, in this section that is known as a gang, there are some other considerations to include in your use of moves and hold. Logically, multiple characters, all engaged in conflict and executing moves, would cause more harm than, say, a single person. Increase the harm value of the gangs by one, two, or three, even, depending on the size of the gang in the scene. Two gangs who engage each other follow the same guidelines. A larger group would get the bonus, of course, and groups of equal size would have the same bonus to harm inflicted. There are some excellent charts to help guide you making those adjustments regarding gangs on page 156 of the core rules, but the logic is simple. If you have a gang fighting by your side, you can increase the harm you inflict if your gang is larger than the opposing gang. Players still execute moves as normal, but their engage in combat is treated as a group event and harm is increased, given, of course, your gang has the superior numbers. Player characters fighting against gangs is significantly different in application and does not follow the same guidelines previously mentioned. First, a group of players is never considered a gang, but you have two times the abilities as a gang member. Therefore, 
If you have a group of five players, for example, the gang that you've fought would need to be at least ten members strong to gain their damage bonus against your group of players. As the Game Master, you have the ability to set up opponents that are challenging, but not impossible for the players to take on, or intentionally difficult to drive the fiction in a specific direction. Players using Act Under Pressure or Observe a Situation might find unique methods to avoid harm that comes from a gang of superior numbers. Players could have advantages that offer edges that might be used during conflicts. Just have them execute moves accordingly, and remind your players who might have such advantages that they are available to them. Sometimes player characters end up in conflict with each other. In these instances, the core rules does have six rules you should be aware of that can be found on page 159. These rules are situational and include the hinder player move as a mitigating factor in the conflict. It also addresses odd numbers of opponents and balancing of harm inflicted based on the variable circumstances. Harming NPCs includes the mechanic of wounds. Wounds are inflicted as harm minus the armor value of the NPC. When an NPC takes wounds from a PC, you will make a harm move describing what happens in the story. Normal humans have three harm moves that can be used as they receive their wounds. Subdued, dying but can be saved, and death. Other creatures may have more than the three harm moves human NPCs have. Inflicting harm on a gang of NPCs works in the same way using harm moves. However, it is spread amongst the gang. The size of the gang determines the amount of wounds it can withstand, ranging from 5 for a small gang up to or even more than 20. There is a list of examples of harm moves for gangs available in the core rules on page 159. Proper setup and moderation of conflicts are very important for the enjoyment of the players and the strength of your game of Cult Divinity Lost. Thank you, Helmgast, for producing this wonderfully dark game and enduring my madness while I produce this content. If you liked this video, please consider clicking the thumbs up and subscribe buttons. Don't forget to click the little bell icon so you know when the next part in this series is available. And visit cultdivinityloss.com for free resources and links to game materials. Thank you.